Let's do that again. Let's give God a hand clap. Amen. Amen. I always like to watch the kids, kids run, because remember when I used to run. Now they're running and something's chasing me. It's had to be something big, because most things I probably wouldn't even run that. We're going to start in um, 1 Kings and the 18th chapter. Um, we're we're going to get there eventually. I've got quite a bit of uh, setting up to do. So sit tight, Sister Mary Lee. We'll, we'll come to you in just a second. Um, but today I wanna, we're going to talk about the prophetic office as it pertains to um, the uh, prophetic order with the, the, the prophet, the priest, and the king. So last week we learned about the, the king, um, the office of being the king, and the, the division between the northern and the southern kingdom, and how that, that division was created by sin. And it was created by priorities that, that, that when, the, when the king or the people have priorities that are higher than in their life than God's will, then we have these divisions and we have these things morph off into different things other than what God intended. And this week we see something similar. We see, or perhaps it's the same thing, but from a different angle, because the office of the prophet in the Old Testament was, was different than the priest or the king. So the priest was the one that was responsible for the actual action, the taking action to, to pacify the wrath of God through sacrifice, through these specific processes and these specific animals that were, were to be raised, to be sacrificed, to pacify the wrath of God so that in the tabernacle or later in the temple there could be communion with God. Amen? And then <clears throat> the, the king was the one to lead the people. That was the one that the people wanted so bad that God actually granted that which world in early, even the one outside of his own will, and they kind of paid a price for that. Amen? But the king's responsibility was to lead the people, encourage the people, and to make the best decisions to lead the people into the, the will of God. And the way that the king would hear the word of God would be through the prophet. Amen? And so the prophetic office, as we see it in the Old Testament, we're going to talk about it, uh, comparing it to the, office of, uh, the prophetic office in the New Testament, in the Bible ministry in a second. But in the Old Testament, prophets were often isolated. They were often alone or just with a servant or two. They were constantly in prayer, and they were constantly alone. They were, they were separated, and they, they were spending time praying and getting to know the will of the Lord. And, and some could even say they, were, they would spend time in heaven, right? There was even times where they, would, they seemingly had out-of-body experiences. The Bible talks about Ezekiel and Isaiah and Jeremiah, and, and, and talking about having a trance, right? And being in such deep prayer. That they could, that they could actually see themselves outside of their body. That it was, they were leaving. They were going into the presence of God. They were having this experience because of their, their, their isolation, because of their commitment to prayer, their commitment to their calling, commitment to prepare the best that they could to, for whatever God had for them. And well, oftentimes God would allow them to see what was coming so that they could warn the king. Right? Sometimes they brought the word of God. Other times they brought the power of God. Right? Other times they would, there was, we'll see in this text that we're going to talk about today, there were many miracles. That there was, there was God standing up and being glorified in the midst of a situation where there was no other explanation other than that is, that is God. That is not just a God, that is the God. The, the God that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that is the, the, the great I am. That is the Almighty. That is Jehovah. He would stand up and be recognized by name because of these prophets, because of the office, because of the places he would send the prophets and the place he would call the prophets to 
and the places where the prophets found themselves. Sometimes God would send them out. Sometimes God would show up and call them over. And other times, in different situations, and Jeremiah, he, he, or Daniel, he just found himself in a situation. But wherever they were, they had responsibility. Wherever they were, they, were, they, they had their priorities set. And understanding and being in the presence of God was their first priority. And then obedience. And I say I set that up to compare it to the modern day prophetic office because it's not the same. It's it's more like the school of the prophets. If you read in first uh, uh, in Samuel and Kings, both first and second uh, Samuel and Kings, you'll hear about the school of the prophets. They were not all a bunch of Ezekiel's and Jeremiah's and Isaiah's running around. Those those prophets were there to go out into the people and to teach the people how to who God was, and teach them the lessons, and teach them the word, and, and try to draw them closer into a relationship with God because they didn't have that dwelling in the Holy Spirit. They, they took people to go out and, and, and teach, right? And that's what the school of the prophets did. It wasn't always about somebody reading your mail and telling you your, your, what, what God's happy with in your life or what God's not happy with with your life. That was very small um, percentage of the prophets. And even of those prophets, it was a very small percentage of their time when you, when you compare it to their whole lifespan. So in today's prophetic office, we have a, 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 dis, a, a disruption. I have not seen in my whole life, I have not seen a true prophet operating in the prophetic office anyway. Uh, maybe you have a pastor, I don't know. But... The, 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 the prophet in the New Testament is supposed to be a part of a five-fold ministry, which means he has to come in and submit and be a part of a ministry. And so many prophets today want to isolate themselves and say they're like the Old Testament prophet, and they're going to come in and bring the word and change everything, and they might have the gift of prophecy. Don't get me wrong. That, I'm not taking anything away from the power of the gift that God has given them. I'm telling you the office that they're walking in is wrong. They've got to get in. They've got to get a part of it. And consequently, if, if not very many prophets are a part of fivefold ministry, there's a lot of fivefold ministry out there that are lacking prophets. It's a great part of the ministry that is designed by God for us to benefit from that we have an opportunity to improve on. That there's a blessing yet out there that God can send us and bless us with uh, somebody new, a new officer, a new somebody who's going to come and minister and and build up the people and help them get closer to God. And occasionally, the move in the power of God. And occasionally, you know, join in with the rest of the fivefold ministry and see the miracles, see the healings. We still have a powerful church. We still have a powerful God that wants to move in all of those things. But it has to be in order. There has to be a structure. Otherwise, that power is out of control. Right, it's it's uh, we'll, we'll come back. To it. I'm sorry, I'm all over the place. So the, the 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 New Testament prophet is different than the Old Testament prophet, right? But it's one of those things where it's just like that, but different. It's just like the school of the prophets, right? And it includes the power and the anointing and the moving of the Holy Spirit, like the the, the major uh, prophets. But it, in a, in a, in, as a part of the ministry, as a part of a team, as a part of the body of Christ in the New Testament. Amen? <clears throat> and there, there are times, in, in, especially in the Old Testament, um, in, every, in every prophet that I, that I can remember anyway, where God brings them to a place or puts them in a place where God says, I got this one, right? Where God is going to make it, he's going to show up in such a way that it is, it almost doesn't matter what the prophet says. God is going to show up, and there is no telling God no at that point. There is no denying. There is no more naysayers. It is, it, it is going to be apparent and evident and powerful that God is here. God is at hand. And, and that's what, where we're going to start in, in uh, 1 Kings in chapter 18. And 
before we read, I'm almost there, <clears throat> give you a little bit more background. This is, we're talking about um, Ahab is the king at this time of Israel, which was the northern kingdom, right? And he was married to this lady named Jezebel. And it was said that Ahab was the worst king that Israel ever had. The absolute, deplorable, depraved, worst king that, that Israel ever had. And he was pretty much married to the worst woman that he could have possibly have been uh, married to. She went out and, and actually killed the prophets. As a matter of fact, she tried to kill all the prophets, and she would have killed Elijah if she was able to find them. But they sent out people to every nation that, that, that they could, and they, they threatened them, saying that if you didn't turn over Elijah, that there was going to be consequences. There was going to be a fire. And they, nobody, nobody could find Elijah. And so we'll learn that Elijah came to, to them in our text. But it was important to note that Jezebel tried to eradicate the, the presence of God in the kingdom. The word of God in the kingdom. She had influence on Ahab of all kinds of wickedness. She would build these, these, these temples in the high places, these places of worships and all of the high places with idols and, and false gods. And there was 450 prophets of, of, of Baal, Baal. It was all kinds of, of wickedness. <clears throat> and <clears throat> then we, we have, we're setting the scene of Elijah saying, you've been looking for me. So here I am. And he reaches back to King Ahab through a guy named Obadiah. And Obadiah has got, that's a whole other, another message in himself. He was, he was faithful to the Lord, but he was Ahab's right hand man. Talk about a difficult position to be in. And so he, he arranges this meeting. And Ahab comes out Notably without Jezebel. And he comes out and he brings 450 prophets of Baal with him. And um, he, who, he, he probably brought some soldiers. And he, he brought all his folks out. And he was going to come and get Elijah. And as, as the story goes, we're not going to go through a blow by blow. The, the, there came a challenge. And the challenge was... Who could bring fire from heaven upon God's altar? Not just any altar. This was an altar to God. Okay? And so the, the prophets of Baal went first, and they, they, they gyrated, and they danced, and they did the, the, the hokey pokey, whatever else they did, from noon until sundown, and nothing happened. And then Elijah, it was all of these hundreds of people Versus Elijah, his servant, maybe a couple of servants, and God Almighty. I know, I know where I'd like to put my my vote, right? And so he tells his servants, take all the water and throw it all over the altar. And then he prays, and fire comes from heaven and devours the altar, the glory of God. Come, the, the heavens open up. This is, this is important. When we hear the heavens open up, we, need, we know we need to take note. They were in a drought for three years. They were in famine for three years, and the heavens opened up, and the first thing that came down was fire to light up the altar so that they could worship and they could sacrifice and they could get back in right standing without using the strange fire. It's it's the exact same answer that he's always answered with. Is get, rebuild the altar and, and get back in the communion, our communion with him. Amen? And so, that happens. Now we read. Sister Mary Lee, will you please pray over the Lord? Lord, we're so grateful for this time of sharing your word. Thank you for everyone who comes today, the new ones that come. Thank you, Lord, for our sin folks that I thought to be able to come to us. We love you, Lord. Thank you for every one of us that has come today to hear the word of God. We thank you for our uh, Pastor James for giving us the straight facts of how it Elijah won over the prophets of Baal. We thank you, Lord.
Lord that Jesus always wins. God is always on top of the top and we will keep him in our hearts. We know he will always guide us. We thank you, Lord, for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. So, <clears throat> 1 Kings chapter 18, we're going to read verses 1 and 2. We're going to skip to 30, and then we're going to do uh, 40 to 46. So, just bear with me, follow me. It will all make sense in the end. And it came to pass, after many days, that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year. Somebody said third year. Saying, Go. Show thyself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. He said, go show yourself to the, the, the people, that the man that hates you the most, your worst enemy, and I will send rain upon the earth. And we need to know that when God says he's going to do something, his job is done. It's already done. No matter what it is from that point on, it's up to us to choose which side of that action we'd like to be on. Yeah. In covenant or out of covenant. Right? right? In the very first verse, he, he, uh, he, he gave a promise to Elijah. <clears throat> and verse 2, and Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was a sore famine in Samaria. A severe famine. Somebody say famine. famine. Verse 30. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Amen. He said, come over here, you're going to want to see this. And then he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And verse 40 says, And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get up, eat, and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. He told his enemy, just after the fire had come down, he rebuilt the altar, the fire came down and lit it, and, and, and devoured the, the, the Bible says. And then he said, now that the, the, the truth is known and the decision is made and God has clearly established his presence and, in the, and his glory has filled this place. He said, Ahab, now in the middle of this famine, you need to get up, you need to eat, you need to drink, you need to stretch. You need to start figuring out your life and moving things around because everything is about to change. And he knew this because he had a promise from back in verse 1, 18 and 1, that said God was going to bring rain to the earth. So in that word that, that Elijah had from God, it was like a, a seed growing in, in his, his belly and you can feel it in his chest. And he knew that he had to do something about it. But what do, we, what do you do? And this is this is where this message comes from. Is we, we, we felt in our spirit, at least I have, that something good was about to happen. Things are, are changing in the spirit and they're changing here at Rock of Faith. What do we do when we feel like something good is about to happen? God is about to move. The, 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 the drought is about to be broken. What do we do? What can we do? When the way that we feel in our spirit doesn't match what we see in the world. Doesn't match what we see when we walk around and we look at our circumstances and we look at our life. And Elijah tells Ahab, 
Something is about to happen and you need to get ready. Eat, drink, get strong. It's been a long day. You just saw 450 of your buddies get slaughtered. And Elijah said to Ahab, get up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went to the top of the Mount Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there is there, there arises a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, Go up, saying to Ahab, Prepare thy chariot and get thee down that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was great rain, and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins, and he ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. My God, there's so much here. And I keep interrupting myself, so I gotta keep going. We're working on my speaking skills, so bear with me. We're gonna figure this out. God is in control, amen. amen. And <clears throat> so I think there's a there's a couple of things to, to point out here that are important. Number one, that there is a sore famine. In the old testament, we see God shutting up the heavens, right? And so there's consequences when there is that, that sort of silence, that sort of separation between God and man. When, when there's no rain, that, when it causes famine. But famine is, is, a, is a, the cumulative effect of drought. When we read the text, we don't read Elijah talking about the famine. He's trying to fight the root cause of the famine, which was the drought. He knows that if, if, he, if he breaks the drought, that the famine will heal itself. Yeah. Amen? And when we talk about drought, I'm always trying to put myself in these situations in the Bible, and I don't really have a point of reference. I talk to my dad. If, if anybody's ever known, or we've known and gone through a real drought, like a third world country drought. I mean, he, he talked about the Great Depression, where the topsoil got blown onto the East Coast and another wind came and blew it out into the into the ocean. And there was there was that was a drought. That was the dust bowl. It was it was difficult. But there was still in some places running water and there was still in some places plumbing when in this situation there was no hope. There was nothing growing. And that creates all kinds of complications in your life. If you're living in this place when there's such a drought, there's no grass growing, so there's no food for the animals. If there's no food for the animals, there's no milk, there's no food there's for, the, for the humans, right? For your family. So now the, this, this drought is causing division in the family because you gotta make decisions, right? You've got to decide when to sell that goat. Do you sell that goat while it's still producing milk because there's some value to selling it, or do you keep it until it doesn't produce milk anymore, and then you, you, you can't do anything with it because it's sick, right? It, it, it divides the economy. It divides sort of your way of life. It also divides families because the men have to get up and they have to go find water, and they have to, they have to take the livestock and, and go into to towns and go other places that they don't normally go to try and find a way for the family. The, the, it is, it's, it's horrible. The ground breaks up and, and dead animals are, are being pecked at everywhere, and fish die in puddles that used to be running water. And in this same famine, it is so bad that there's one woman the Bible talks about that was considering selling her children. That's, that's I, I can't comprehend that. I can't put myself in that, in that position because I grew up in a house where I could take a half hour shower. I could 
I can leave the sprinklers on because I forgot to turn them off. I could, one time I went for, we were filling up the pool and I forgot to turn that off and almost flooded the whole house. It's, it's, it, how do you relate to this sort of destitute desperation when water is not a problem, even in, you know, that we're coming out of the worst drought we've ever seen in California. This is a different thing that we're talking about. And I think that it's important because when, the, when God shuts up the heavens and, and causes this sort of drought that, that leads to famine, that leads to all of this confusion and destruction, he's making a point and we need to pay attention to it. But it's in this environment, in this situation, that God sends his prophet. And his prophet Elijah, is, he's, he's, he's isolated away and God gave him a brook that he could drink from him. And God sent the ravens to bring him food. And he was completely taken care of. While everybody else was forced to find a way to live in this destitution, this desperate, dry situation, they, they, they found ways of dysfunction to live. They found ways to live being separated from their spouse. They found ways to, to stay alive, <clears throat> to keep their kids alive through through eating different things that we're normally eating. It was, it was difficult to live in that situation, but they found a way. And you, if you ever find yourself in that situation, it's very difficult to think that, that there's something that you can do to change your situation. You wake up and find yourself in a three year famine, right? How is it that you have the audacity to think that there is anything that you can do to change your circumstance, much less everybody else's circumstance? But Elijah was no stranger to the power of God. And he spent time with God, and he spent time in prayer, and he understood because he had a word growing in his spirit that God was promised to send rain upon the earth. And it's, it's, it's also important to note, and I'm just, I'm not going to suggest anything. I'm just going to note that if you go back in history, there, at this same time period, there is not one reference to drought in the southern kingdom whatsoever. This drought was specific to the northern kingdom because of Ahab's wickedness. So, you're, you're, you're in this situation. <clears throat> and I think when, when you're talking about the power of God, we talked about earlier, I mentioned that it needs structure, right? We need to be united. We need to work as a body. And, you know, I've, I've been all over the country. I've been in several different uh, countries, and I've seen all kinds of different people, and I've seen all kinds of different churches. Right? And some, sometimes the, the people with the most power, the real power of God operating in your life. There's, there's been several people that we've met that, come, that have come through during the years. Powerful men and women of God that, that came through and we witnessed the power of God and they went on and nothing ever happened. And it's not that the power of God wasn't with them, it's that they, they didn't have structure. They weren't plugged in to a system, right? They weren't plugged into the body of Christ. They were isolated. They were trying to apply the Old Testament model to the New Testament. And it's, it's difficult. There's a reason why we need to be a part, of, a, a part of the body of Christ. We need each other. We need support. We need prayer. We need to learn. We need to teach. We need to interact. We need, we need to sharpen each other. This is all the things about being a part of the body of Christ that are important that nobody is above or separated from. Amen. And so you see other churches that, that have laser shows and smoke going up and the best praise and worship you've ever seen because everybody's a professional musician and singer and no power whatsoever. None. And so there, there's got to be a way to achieve the right thing, right? There's 
a way for us to get more structured so that the power is more impactful, it's more efficient. What good is electricity if there's no power grid to get it out? And so we've got the power, we need the structure. It's got to be balanced. It's got to be in the, it's got to be the will of God. Amen. It's, there's, a, there's a blueprint here. But it starts with us individually. And I find it fascinating. And I'm not I'm not calling anybody anybody, anybody out by name, but I'm gonna call some people out by name. It's it's I'll start with myself. It is fascinating to me that that people who think that I'm uh, I'm talented or, or gifted or blessed or whatever, if, if you consider that to be so, that, you know, that there's no dry places in my life, that there's no droughts in my life, that I, if I'm good at one thing, then I'm good at everything. And that's not the case with Pastor Jess or Pastor Linda or Pastor Ray. It's not, it's not true about anybody in this room. It's not, any, it's not true about anybody in this world. We all have we all have droughts in our life. We all have dry places in our life that, that hold us back from getting us from, from us getting where we need to be, where God wants us to be. It is possible to know the scriptures inside and out and not be good at marriage. It's it's possible to to know how to sing and know every song in the hymn book, but, but not be a good parent. It's possible to be a good parent but not be a good spouse. It's possible to, 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 to be a business owner and not be good at managing money. All of these things are possible, which is why the dynamic of people being able to teach something they can't do and being able to do things that they can't teach is very important. Because if we don't recognize the, the dry places in our life, then we'll never get where, we'll never get the rain. That's right. The rain can't come with the with the sand. The rain can't come with the unorganization. The rain has to have power. The rain has to the the rain is there. It's up to us. We're gonna we're gonna go over a game plan in a minute. But I think it's fascinating that. You know, a lot of people are, are, are better at hiding it than others. And we, we might put makeup on, or we might drive a, a better car, or we might put on a, a, you know, a better suit. Or we try and hide our dry places as best we can. And those people that look at us, you know, sometimes it, it, it's taken for granted the, the type of perseverance or struggle that it's taken to get where we are. Amen. Amen. But God's, God's reign is promised, and his, his breakthrough is promised. Amen? Amen. Amen. <clears throat> what becomes important through all of this is how we heal. Right? So we are a full gospel church. And we have great emphasis on the gifts of the Spirit and speaking in tongues. And as I get older, I, I've come to understand that it's not only about getting the tongue to speak, but also getting the ear to hear. How else can we ever have anything to say? How else can we ever agree on anything if we don't have the ear to hear? And I look at Elijah, and he heard the voice of the Lord because he sought him, and he spent time with him. And God said he was going to send rain on the earth. And then all of these things happened. And Elijah is, is, is standing there, and we should always follow someone who hears better than we do. That's right. Because 
it takes leaders like Elijah to hear the, the, the craziness, the foolishness, the, the ridiculousness of, of God's real purpose and plan for our life that doesn't make sense to anybody in the world. It doesn't make sense that in the middle of a three-year famine that Elijah tells his servants to throw water all over the, the altar. That doesn't make a lick of sense in the world, but he knew God's promise. He knew God was about to deliver the rain and God was about to do something great. Yeah, sure. And that word was in his spirit and it was standing up and it created boldness. It created thinking that didn't make sense to the world. I mean, and it didn't make sense to, to people who don't believe. But it, it's okay that it doesn't make sense to anybody else. That doesn't change the way that you act. Amen. That shouldn't change right. the way that you operate. Yeah. That doesn't that shouldn't change the way that you follow people. You should never follow anybody that doesn't hear better than you. That's where division comes from, frustration and rebelliousness, because you're seeing something totally different. We need to everything that you see today, with down to the detail, was heard by that man before it ever got here. And one, one of these days, you ask him how I got up here. That's a, that's a different story. He'll tell you about that privately, but it's it is he, he heard it. And then there's other people who have to run. And in, in this day and age, runners are few and far between. You know, Elijah's servant ran up that, that mountain in a drought. I imagine it was pretty hot. Six times he ran up there for nothing. For nothing. And he knew it was nothing because he told him to go seven times. But he did it anyway. Sometimes we've got to move and it's got to be for nothing. And it doesn't matter if we see what the pastor sees or we see what Pastor Ray sees. It doesn't what we see doesn't matter because they've heard it. And if we we do we act with, with, without uh, an, 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 a promise of incentive, right, we get to be a part of the blessing too. Yeah. The fact that Elijah saw everything on the outside as dried up and dead and, 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 and worthless, he still believed that the promise of God on the inside was going to heal on the outside. And so he began to make changes. He told Ahab, he said, Ahab, you're going to have to make changes around this place. So Elijah began to make the changes on the outside. He said, you've got to tear down all of those high places where you're worshiping these false gods. Where all of the influence that has come from, from Jezebel, all of that needs to be undone. Right. needs to be torn down. Right. needs to be eliminated. Yes. As we said earlier, the, the reign of the, the blessing of God, the promise of God, the, the, the intention of God will not come until we get, get ready. And God forbid, forbid it comes too soon because then we're, we're not, we, we can't benefit from it. We'll, we'll see that in a second. But in our life, <clears throat> there's different influences. That need to come down. There's, <clears throat> there's, <clears throat> there's pride. There's, there's fear. As we find ourselves in this situation, we find that we we depend on our senses. We find that we're looking at the same thing the world is looking. But there's sometimes when, or every time we, we get along with God and we start to pray, we feel this down in our belly, this promise. He reminds us of his word. He reminds us that we're, we're, we're to be blessed, that we're to be anointed, 
that we are to be full of His power, full of His Spirit. And those that, that promise starts to dwell in your spirit, and it starts to, the, the more you pray, the stronger it gets. The more that you pray, the stronger it gets. And every single time you're in the presence of God, you feel it grow. And so if, at, at one point, now you, you find yourself, and, and, you, and you, it, maybe it's not a drought, right? You wake up, and you're, and you're praying, and in your spirit, you feel abundance, but you're living in lack. Other times, you're, you're living in depression, but in your spirit, there's joy. Other times, you're, you're living in loneliness, but in your spirit, you, you, you know marriage. All of these things, no matter what your dry place is, God wants to heal it. It's what Solomon was so excited about and he was so worried about when they finished the temple. And the fire from heaven came down on the altar again, so they wouldn't have strange fire. This concern in 2 Chronicles 7, 13, says, If I shut up heaven, that there be no rain, my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. That's what God wants to do. He wants to heal your land. Whatever your dry area is, whatever your struggle is, he wants to go to the root of the family so that you don't have to pray all the times around the side effects. That he's going to go to the root of your problem and heal your land so that you can be delivered in a permanent way. You can be delivered to receive the blessing and the promise that God has always had for you. And you can't see it on the outside. It has to be everything that is done in the flesh has to be done in the spirit first. You don't, you first you get healed in your spirit before you get healed in your body. You get delivered in your spirit before you get delivered in your situation. That this God's whole concept to let it be on earth as it is in heaven. <clears throat> We're going to skip around a little bit, but if you go to 1 Corinthians 2 and 9, it says, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. The, the, God goes from deep to deep, from glory to glory. We, in this one chapter, we're talking about fire coming from heaven and then an abundance of rain that just pours out of nowhere in the same chapter. That's how God wants to deal with us. Spirit to spirit, deep to deep, glory to glory. Amen? For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. You, it can, you can't even comprehend it. You can't even think of it. You can't guess. It has to be planted in your spirit before you even consider it. But once you have it, God's done. Once you have his word, his part is done. Now it's up to us to tear down the high places of of pride and ego and longing to be a part of the world and, and, and chasing finances and, and all those other things have got to come down. And God has to be our first priority in life no matter what. And then he can move. Hebrews 11.3 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is at the root of what we're talking about. We're talking about the Word of God connecting with our faith. Faith has to exist first so that there is a place for God to deposit His Word. Once those two things connect, it's done. Then we look at the book of James and we look around and says, what can I do anywhere to do something? I can't earn salvation. But I can improve my relationship with the Lord by tearing down those high places. But I can turn my back on, on, on the evil and the wicked ways of the world. Right? And then God will heal my man. He is the word. <clears throat> For by it the elders obtained a good report. 
If you want to learn how to get in right standing with God, here it is. The elders good, got a good report because they were faithful. They believed and they acted their actions with their, with their faith. Amen? But here's the important part. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Through faith, the world was framed by the word of God so that things which are seen, things that we see, were not made of things that do appear. So everything is born in the spirit first, created by faith by Jesus and rolled out into our life. It, all of the change, all of the deliverance, all of the healing, all of this starts inside of us. That's the only place it can start. It will not come from the outside in. It will only come from the inside out. So we've got some responsibility in this. We've got some, some work to do in our own life to, to separate. Just to, to tear down. To, first, we've got to rebuild the altar. We've got to re reestablish our connection with, with, the, with the Almighty. Then we've got to tear down the high places. We've got to change the people that we listen to. We've got to kill 450 prophets. All the false prophets, all the voices in your head saying you can't do it, you're not good enough, you're never going to have anything, you're never going to be anybody. All of those have to come down. All of those have to be killed. They have to be cast out. Because that's not what God's word said. So, so Elijah... The Bible says he, he casts himself down to the earth and he puts his head between his knees. Amen. And in, in context, it is, it's the ultimate act of submission. But it's so much more. It's so much more. He, he, if, you're, if you're on the ground and you put your head between your knees, you're, you are as small as you can get. You are as close to your sinner as you can ever be. He was trying to get as close to the word as he could. And then he takes his knees and he covers his ears so he can hear the word better because he doesn't want to hear what everybody's saying on the outside. He only wants to hear better what God is telling him on the inside. And so, like he does, he isolated himself and he cut off all other influences and he focused on the word of God. Word. And he told his servant, go up. And his servant ran six times for nothing. And every time he came back, he said, it's not there yet, it's not there yet, it's not there yet. I wasn't going to say this, Dad, but I must say it. The, the pastor needs people to tell him the truth. He can't make decisions on yes with yes men. can't make decisions with the best case scenario. We've got to look him in the face and tell him the truth. No matter what it is that we're doing for the ministry or in a situation, that there's, there's difficult, there is, we live in the world, but sometimes things happen. People show up at whatever it's the situation may be. We need to tell him the truth, right? We need to be honest. He needs to be able to depend on us and not try and make a decision for this church based on misinformation, incomplete information, or otherwise. <clears throat> While we're running up the hill for free, not complaining. I complain. <clears throat> and so Elijah, with his head between his knees, is focused on the Lord. The sermon comes back the seventh time. And he says, I see this cloud. It's about the size of a man's hand. And Elijah says, that's it. Tell Ahab it's time. He's got to get in his chariot. And he's got to get out of here. Because if, if we don't prepare for what God is going to do in this place, now, when it happens, it'll be short-lived because we weren't ready for it. Right. The structure, right? The, the people, the, the participation. All of that stuff, it, we, the prophecy was that people were going to be 
and the streets looking through the windows. We got some work to do. We've all got some obedience to, to deal with in our lives, some changes to make in our lives so, so that we can get ready for that. Okay? Amen? This church has power. It shouldn't be a secret. Amen. <clears throat> and so Ahab took off. And if I was Elijah, I probably would have been like, hey, what about me? <laughs> and so Elijah didn't let that stop him. The Bible says he girded up his loins. He, he wore this, this, this sheep's cloth, right, that was down past his knees and it was heavy. And he, he girded it up and he said, watch this. And he outran Ahab all the way back to, to the house. Amen. Who was riding a chariot. One, two, ten horses, who knows? Because the hand of God was on him. But it's interesting to note that in anywhere I've looked, and I'm, I'm open to be corrected if I'm wrong. If the hand of God is on Elijah when he's running back, what hand is, is the cloud? Whose hand is the cloud? I've always, I've always looked, I've always thought that the hand of a man, the cloud the size of a man's hand, was the hand of God. But nowhere else in scripture is the hand of God on two people in the same scene or in two different places in the same scene. And so I'll offer an opinion. I'm not, I'm offering an opinion, that's all. We know that the prophet spent time in heaven. He spent time with God. And he, in this instant, he had the promise of God standing up in his, in his situation, standing up in his life, but he was, he was penetrating out from the spirit into the world. Elijah had a breakthrough. And in my mind, it was as he was reaching back from the presence of God into the world, and his hand broke through. And he knew he had a breakthrough in the spirit, and then the, then the rain broke through as well. And that's what I'm here to encourage you today, is that breakthrough is here. We've got, to, we've got to rebuild the altar. We've got to tear down those things. We've got to pray like we've never prayed. We've got to hear like we've never heard. And we've got to run. We've got to get up and go, and we've got to move quickly and we're going to have to run. It's not going to be a short run. It's quick. It's a, it's, a, it's a half a verse in the Bible. But I don't know how many miles it was. It was from Mark Car Carmel all the way back to Samaria. That's that's quite a that's a run. That ain't that is not just a, a job. Yeah. But the rain came right behind him. Amen. And he wiped out the the, the drought. And he wiped out the famine. And he changed the situation for everybody. And you're not in your situation for nothing. You may have been praying for years, and you may feel like you've been running for years. You're not in your situation for nothing. You're in your situation so that other people around you can see the power of God in your life, and you can be delivered from that dry area. Whether it be hidden or public, God is going to deliver you from that root problem that's been holding you back, been holding this church back from its breakthrough. Every single one of us collectively having a breakthrough together means Rock of Faith has a breakthrough. Yeah. Amen. Praise God. I'm going to stop there. I think. Amen. <clears throat> We're going to move to communion, and I'm going to ask Pastor Rick to come. But as he comes, I just...